I don't even cover it up. <laughs> Good. <laughs> it's better to be that way. <laughs> so uh, anyway, because uh, Dave may have lots of lives to save and patients to take care of, but uh, I want to introduce Professor Dave Pearson. Uh, he has a wonderful career in Toledo. He was he came through our department, and then now he's a a great professor of medical physics at uh, UTMC. So today he's going to talk about that type of career. Take it away, Dave. So yes, as Rick said, my name is David Pearson. I actually was in this REU program, sat in this room during the during the presentation. Um, I was part of an exchange program from Salford University in Manchester, England. And so I spent my I spent one year of my undergraduate here, decided to come back, um, did a PhD here, uh, started in solid state physics, so it's not too late. Um, <laughs> about a third to a halfway through, um, I decided that this wasn't going to be for me, that I couldn't really picture myself doing postdocs and becoming a, uh, becoming a professor in a research lab. Just didn't it didn't really appeal to me as much as I, I thought it might. So I looked for something else to do, and I found medical physics as uh, as an alternative uh, as an alternative career option. So that's that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, I have multiple jobs. Uh, one of them is being a medical physicist. I work at um, University of Toledo uh, primarily. I'm also at Bowling Green. Um, so uh, we go down to there is fairly small clinic. We go down there once a week. Um, I also run the admissions for medical school. I'm assistant dean of admissions for the medical school and co-chair of um, the admissions committee for the medical school. I'm quite possibly the only physicist uh, that is involved in medical school admissions. Um, I run the scholarship committee as well. And just, I mean, I'm just kind of like got my fingers in lots of lots of different things. Um, but probably one of the more relevant things today is I run the residency program that we have at the University of Toledo College of Medicine for medical physicists. So physics does require a residency uh, in the same way that an MD has to do residency to go into a specialty. Uh, we have to do residency to go into um, medical physics as a career option. And I started that program about four or five years ago. We've always had a strong graduate program. But then our graduate students, our master's degree students and our PhD students had to go somewhere else to do their residency training. And uh, that's where the bottleneck is in our education program. It's, uh, it's not super competitive to get into the master's degree program or the PhD program. Um, but it is relatively competitive to get into a residency program. So you have to choose a very strong graduate program uh, in order to guarantee that you'll, you'll get accepted into residency. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, so, first of all, we're going to talk about what a medical physicist is, because I, I don't expect um, that everyone's going to know this, uh, even know about, know that there was physicists that worked in every radiation oncology in the department in the country will have a physicist on staff. That's a lot of physicists. That's a lot of, a lot of physics graduates that you don't even know, that we didn't even know about. There, there's, there's more physicists working in hospitals in this area than you would realize. You would think like, well, what can you do with a degree in physics that's actually physics, right? Well, first of all, you can work at a university and become a professor of physics. Uh, if you happen to have a solar cell factory, you might be able to work there. But what else is there for, for physicists that's a physics job? A lot of physicists go into, do PhD in physics and then go into something like the stock exchange. Um, but there are physicists in every radiation oncology department in every hospital in the country. It, by, by law, we have to be involved. Uh, radiation oncology patients cannot get treated unless we sign off on it. So, so that means there's, we are a pretty big job market. Um, our department is, uh, we have four faculty, uh, four residents, about eight to 10 graduate students in the master's degree program and usually about five PhD students at any one time. So we could fill this room, with just medical physics faculty and, and, and students and everybody in our department today. And, you know, so it's a, it's a you know, pretty big full-time job. What we do, well, I mean, this doesn't really help you. Uh, this is very, very broad, and it talks about diagnostic medical physics and uh, therapy physics. Uh, the vast majority of physicists, we'll, we'll show this later, uh, these are the different subspecialties. So physicists can work in therapy, 
Uh, we'll, we'll show this letter, like how many work in therapy, how many work in diagnostic. Um, you knew someone, that Angela, who's a diagnostic medical physicist. So there's people that work in diagnostic imaging. Um, and then there's, you know, there's, there's other branches. They tend to get smaller as you go, as you go down. Therapy is, um, is the biggest. So we're part of um, a team of professionals that works on radiation oncology patients. So one of the things we're going to do today is to, to, to try and give you an example about what we do is to show you the process, like from a patient being diagnosed with cancer to the point that they start radiation therapy, uh, what happens? And then we'll talk about what uh, I do along the way. So we, we work alongside physicians, physician colleagues who have uh, an MD and who've been to uh, residency for radiation oncology and are board certified by the American Board of Radiology. We've been through residency and we've Oh, okay. Did I somehow mute myself? <laughs> uh, I've lost control of my keyboard. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Hi, so why do we go into medical physics? So what was it that attracted me to a uh, career in medical physics was um, uh, the opportunities to work with patients. That was something that was appealing to me uh, to work in a clinical environment rather than a purely research environment. Um, uh, job satisfaction is obviously very important, cannot be understated. Uh, if you if you enjoy what you do, then you've then you've chosen the right job, the right career. And if this is something that I I really enjoy doing. I can't really imagine myself doing anything else now. And um, I've been at the University of Toledo uh, in um, working as a medical physicist since 2005. I haven't changed jobs. I haven't moved somewhere else. Uh, I've and, and actually. Almost everybody in the department is the same. We've all been in the same place for a long time. And so that's how you know that you, you're at a good place when, when no one is leaving. <laughs> everybody, everybody's been there forever. Um, so medical physicists have to be qualified. Uh, you, you can work as an unqualified medical physics physicist, uh, but you can't work independently. You have to work under somebody who is board certified that can sign off on you. Um, which is which is a good option for people that are trying to get into the field and work their way up. Um, but the goal for most people is to become board certified, and we'll talk about what the process is um, that, we, is, that is required for that. Uh, to become board certified in medical physics, radiation oncology, or actually I think medical physics, any, any subspecialty, um, you need to have a, a graduate degree. Uh, it can be a master's degree or a PhD, but it has to be from an accredited program, specifically accredited by an organization called CAMPET, a credit our uh, education programs. And uh, following graduation, you have to do the residency, it's typically two years, and then following that, you get a job. And during this, during uh, your education, you'll be taking board exams. So there's three, three board exams. You take one of them uh, during graduate school, uh, once you finish your classes. Uh, one of them you take once you've finished your clinical education and residency, and then uh, you take a third exam a year later once you've had one year of actual work experience under your belt, uh, working underneath another board certified physicist who signs off on you. And once you've done that, you take an, you, the final phase is actually an oral exam. So we go through oral exams, um, just like our physician colleagues. And uh, once you've done that and you pass, then you get to be board certified and you probably get a nice little bump in pay because you can do stuff independently now. No one has to actually sign off on you. So let's just look at the, uh, the, 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 the practice, the, the pathway to practice in a little bit more detail. Um, by the way, not all medical physicists do end up working in the clinic. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but the vast majority will be aiming to work in a clinic. Um, and to do that, you need the undergraduate uh, degree, 
uh, it doesn't, you don't have to be a physics major. You can actually be a physics minor. There are a specific set of classes that you have to take at the undergraduate level, things like um, uh, there is a class that you have to take, like modern physics, you have to take ENM, um, but you don't actually have to take everything required to be a physics major. Um, following that, you apply to a graduate program. There are a number of graduate training programs around the country. Um, Toledo has a master's degree program and a PhD program, which is actually kind of rare. Uh, University of Michigan only has a PhD program. Uh, OSU only has a PhD program. Um, there are other program. There are other programs. I think uh, Case Western. Um, not sure what they have, but I think they've only got a master's degree program. So some of these places have residency, some don't. So it's really nice to be at the place where you've got the option to go straight from the graduate program into the residency program. Um, but some places you have to do the graduate training in one place and then go and find a residency somewhere else because they don't have all of them. Uh, and then, as as we talked about, you have to do um, you have to do the uh, ABR, yeah. And all of this through all of this, you have to make sure that the programs that you're going to are CAMPUP accredited. Uh, a graduate medical physics degree that's not CAMPUP accredited is is not going to be too much use to you if you're planning on becoming board certified. Uh, thankfully, the majority of them are, but that's there. There's um, Programs that are becoming accredited, that's probably up there, but some that are some that are not accredited, you should try and avoid. Um, so what percentage of medical physicists work in what areas? So the vast majority of them work in, in radiation oncology, radiation therapy. So we radiation therapy is the biggest employer of medical physicists, and therefore one of the biggest employers of physicists total. Um, imaging physicists, there's not as many. Uh, we don't need as many uh, imaging physicists. Every hospital needs to have an imaging physicist on staff, but they don't. They're not necessarily at that you, that one place all of the time. So, for example, Flower Hospital in Sylvania has a diagnostic medical physicist, but that diagnostic medical physicist also works at like five other places testing their X-ray units. It wasn't something that ever really appealed to me. Uh, it's more it's more technological. It's more best. It's uh, testing. Um, so I, I'm pro I'm not going to put a good spin on, on imaging physics. Uh, so I apologize to anybody anybody that's in imaging physics. I don't know enough about it to really uh, give a good impression. But when I heard about it and I heard about radiation oncology physics, I was just like straight to interested in radiation oncology physics. I didn't even know um, that that was the biggest market. The first medical physicist I ever met was a diagnostic imaging physicist uh, who was going through a program, a PhD program uh, here. And he told me about what he did, and he told me about what he'd heard that the radiation oncology physicist did. And so I went and contacted a radiation oncology physicist and got a job. Um, there's other branches of, uh, of uh, areas that you can work in. There are some medical physicists that work in product development for companies uh, and administrative support and things like that. Um, some work for the some have to work for the government. Um, but they're actually fairly, those are all very small employers. As I said, every radiation oncology department has to have uh, a medical physicist. So they have to be there. Like they have to be there every time certain patients are treated. We have to be on site. We have to be at the machine for the treatment. So that means there has to be quite a few of us. So we're going to talk about the different aspects of uh, medical physics. The biggest one is going to be the clinic. The biggest part of most physicist jobs is the clinic. For some people, this is the only part of the job. Um, they're probably involved in regulatory complaints, meaning that uh, if a radiation oncology department is inspected by Ohio State, uh, sorry, Ohio, um, uh, the State Department for Ohio, um, that that they're following all the regulations, doing everything that's actually required. Um, some physicists will work in research. They will, they will be uh, employed purely as researchers. Um, some people will be educators as well. And some people will do all of these things. So this is, uh, I do all of those. I work in the clinic. That's my primary, that's my primary thing. That's what I mostly get paid for. Um, I do a little bit of research because I work with students. I teach classes. I teach labs. Um, I teach clinical practice for residents. Um, occasionally teach med students. Um, but that is only because I work at a teaching hospital. Um, the vast majority of physicists will work in clinical practice. 
and they don't have to do research. They don't have to uh, be involved in education. So it really is up to you. So every year, the uh, the our uh, our uh, body, our national body, the American Association of Medical Physicists, uh, does a survey. So this is pretty old data, 2002, but it really it hasn't really changed. The vast majority of us work primarily in the clinic. That so this survey said, what do you do primarily? And 78% uh, said we work in a clinic primarily. That doesn't mean that they don't do anything else. Uh, as I said, I do clinic, academic, research. I do administration because I work for the medical school. Not so much the other things. Um, but basically, I could have picked any one of those things. But primarily, the vast majority of my time is spent in the clinic. So I was one of the 78% that said clinic. So it's not really a useful statistic. Uh, what is more of a useful statistic is where do you work? If you work at a university hospital, you're probably doing clinic and education and research. But if you're working in a private practice, like over at Flower Hospital in Sylvania, you're primarily just doing clinic. So uh, this slide here kind of gives you an idea of like what uh, the clinic work involves. What do we do on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, I kind of mentioned that we will go to treatments. So for any patient that is... Uh, uh, getting a high dose of radiation um, in a small number of treatments, a uh, stereotactic style treatment, we will we will be there at the machine reviewing the images prior to the, to our therapist turning on the beam of radiation. Um, so that that takes up some of our time. Uh, we have to go through every every medical chart, electronic medical record of every treatment to verify that what we intended the treatment to do actually happened so we can we can actually look at the records for the machine and verify that that, that everything's been going correctly or we can review the images for the patients um so all of those things kind of have that's our kind of day-to-day -day, uh what we do um we have to we have we are responsible for the radiation generating equipment so we have linear accelerators um our linear accelerators cost between two and a half and five million dollars each uh, unlike Rick's accelerator, it works all of the time. It's really good. <laughs> it's like 99% of the time it's working. Um, and it has to, right? We have patients that are scheduled all day, and that, so the machine has to be pretty reliable. Um, but, you know, things can go wrong, and it could start outputting the wrong amount of radiation or the wrong type of radiation or the quality of the radiation could, could not be what we want. So... Uh, we have to test that, so we test it uh, every every month. We do tests on it every day. The therapists do tests on it, and we have to review the records. But we do uh, testing uh, every month. So uh, last night, once the clinic had finished treating patients, I was I stuck around until about eight thirty doing uh, tests on the machine to make sure everything was working correctly. Uh, we do dose calculations, quality assurance. Um, we do kind of liaise between um, other professionals. Um, so there's like there's a professional side to it. You need to be, you know, kind of you need to be a professional, uh, professionally dressed. You need to be able to interact with patients. You need to be able to interact with um, other medical specialists. Um, so that's kind of maybe a little bit unique to our field. I'm not sure. Um, this is just some more information about what we do. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples of kind of like special things we do, things that we don't do every day, um, but it is our responsibility to make sure these things get done. So one of them is shielding. Um, our This is a picture of a linear accelerator, one of our treatment machines, inside a shielded bunker. Uh, our, our bunker looks quite a lot like this. We have a main entrance door. There's only one door coming in and out. Uh, we come in here, there's a maze to actually block radiation from hitting the door. Uh, but the door is also shielded with lead and hydro hydrogenous material to shield from neutrons. Um, the walls tend to be about six to eight feet of eight feet of high density concrete, um, and so we have to des we have to design this. Um, we don't do it very often. Only when we buy a new machine, which only occurs maybe every five to ten years. Um, but once we do this, it's a big part of the job is to make sure that every everything is um, everything is shielded correctly. We have to survey uh, the room every year, go around with a radiation detector, uh, a Geiger counter, and a neutron detector to make sure that there's no uh, leakage escaping. So, I'll give you an example of uh, a situation where this didn't work out so well. So I was at an unnamed hospital uh, out on the border between Indiana and Ohio. 
uh, where I was a consultant physicist. Um, I was not the person that designed the vault, but I was the person that took over from the person that designed the vault. And so I was doing my annual radiation survey and I had the radiation, the machine, uh, pointed at the wall. So I had the beam uh, pointed at the wall that I was shielding and I was scanning across. I had the machine set to maximum aperture um, and so that it would, you know, it radiates as much of the wall as possible. And I had the collimator rotated 45 degrees. So instead of being a big square, it was actually a big diamond. And as I was scanning with my radiation detector along the wall, uh, all of a sudden it just went off the chart. Mm -hmm. And so I found that the people that had designed the vault um, had not designed this barrier to be thick enough. So this barrier, you see it sticks out here. Mm -hmm. This has to be thick enough for the, uh, for the maximum field size of the beam to hit that. And what happened was they didn't design it big, uh, um, bit large enough. The machine was possibly too far away from the wall, uh, hadn't been where they intended it to be, or they just hadn't taken into account that someone might actually rotate the field. And so it actually spilled off over the edges. So that was an expensive fix. They had to, they had to fix that. Um, but that's just a kind of an example of what we do. Uh, this is what one of our machines looks like when you take all the plastic covers off. Uh, so this is the patients don't really get to see this, but this is what's um, underneath. Um, the accelerator guide is actually up at the top here. Um, it's a microwave guide, uh, wave guide uh, that accelerates electrons. Uh, we can accelerate electrons up to about 25 MeV. Um, they then go through a 90 degree bending magnet, and then the, the beam is directed down onto the patient. We generally don't treat with beams of electrons. Uh, we generally treat with beams of photons. And so we have um, a tungsten plate that we call the target that sits in the path of the electron beam and produces Bramstrahlung photons. So it's a uh, high Z material, high density, high melting point. And it's bombarded with a very high intense, intensity beam of focused for electrons. Uh, the beam of electrons is only about a millimeter in diameter. Um, so it essentially is a spot uh, a spot size um, of about a millimeter, and then it produces uh, um, a, a, a diverging beam of photon radiation uh, that then, then goes down towards the patient. The machine can rotate around the patient. It can collimate itself to lots of different complicated shapes. Uh, we have an X-ray. We have a detector panel underneath. It's an amorphous silicon, so, uh, essentially a solar panel, but position sensitive. Uh, it's about 30 by 40 centimeters. We have um, an X-ray tube over here and another uh, detector panel that's the same, but tuned to uh, detect um, kilovoltage X-rays as, as opposed to megavoltage X-rays. So we can actually take a CT of the patient while the patient's on the table to verify their position. So that's kind of the clinical side of what we do. Um, if you work at an academic place, you, you can be involved in teaching, which is another level of gratification on top of working with patients. I really like the work, working with um, students and residents. Um, for me, just working in the clinic would probably not be enough. I think I would get a little bit bored. Um, but this kind of really mixes it up when you have uh, students that are going through graduate programs and graduating every few years. So our students go into our residency, as we mentioned. So this is, these are our students um, graduating and, and matching, uh, matching into a residency program. So we have, we have that, we have our residents ourselves, we're four residents. So I'm gonna do a quick uh, detour now to talk about research. So medical physicists don't have to be involved in research. It's kind of a choice. Um, if you do a PhD in medical physics, obviously you may be someone that is interested in research. Uh, if you're not interested in, in uh, research or education, you can, you can do a master's degree uh, and that's totally fine. Um, you can work in clinical practice with a master's degree. You don't need a PhD, but if you really want to get involved in research and education, it generally is a good idea to have a, uh, have a PhD. So what kind of research do we do? We do? Well, um, uh, obviously. The kind of physics research that you're familiar with is going to be, I guess, what um, what we would call like fundamental uh, research. You're working towards a goal um, to develop something or investigate something that that may be used in technology, like way 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 in the future. Uh, so, for example, I was originally working on magnetic thin films with the application that it could be used in uh, in a hard drive. 
but I might never see the hard drive that it created. Uh, I would just, you know, be aware that uh, a company like Seagate had bought the, you know, that had developed, paid for the research or funded the research. Um, but you don't necessarily work to the end goal, right? Well, that's not necessarily the case in medical physics. You might be working on technological applications that are actually used uh, in the clinic on patients. So we can, for example, get um, permission to use um, to 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 actually experiment and test the stuff that we that we want to do on patients. Now, as you would imagine, that is not an trivial thing to do. You have to make sure that what you're testing is safe and you have to jump through a lot of uh, hoops for good reason to make sure that what we're testing on patients is very likely to to be the best thing that we could do. But that's how that's how we, that's how the, the field moves forward. Um, that kind of stuff is generally only done at academic hospitals uh, like the University of Toledo. Um, so we, uh, for example, this paper here, um, we weren't developing anything new here. We were actually testing, uh, retrospectively analyzing the quality of treatments that we had designed specifically for patients that were getting very, very focused beams of radiation to lesions in the brain. And we were, in this paper, we took, uh, I think it was 42, 41 patients. Um, some of those patients had maybe five to seven different individual brain metastases. And so we analyzed all of this data and looked to see what was the quality of our treatments. Now, the reason we did this is because we had a brand new machine. Uh, it was only the fourth one ever sold in the US. So we were trying to prove what this machine could do with the technology that it had. And so we retrospectively, after after a few years of treating on this on this machine, uh, we published a paper um, to show the quality of the treatments uh, that we could get from from this machine. So it was you know pretty straightforward stuff, uh, retrospect retrospectively analyzing data that we had collected from from a couple of years of, of treating patients. Um, in a paper here, we tested the hypothesis that. If you um, put abdominal pressure on a patient that is being treated for lung cancer, you will be able to immobilize the lesion. So the idea was that if you put abdominal pressure on a patient, the patient won't be able to breathe as deeply. They will take shallow breaths. Therefore, the tumor will move less. And when you're trying to direct a beam of radiation onto a moving target in a lung, as the lung tumor is moving up and down with respiration, that the abdominal pressure would help. Lots of clinics bought into this and used it. Um, this research paper showed that it did nothing at all. <laughs> it didn't. It didn't help in the slightest. In some cases, it made it worse. Uh, caveat was that it could have been the the actual device that we were using or the way that we were using it. Um, but uh, we uh, we retrospectively analyzed um, many patients over a few years that had been tortured with this abdominal compression, <laughs> and we found that it it didn't do anything. It hadn't helped. Uh, theory, the theory we came up with was that the patients, when when you push on the patient's abdomen to try to reduce the uh, motion of the lung, they just breathed anyway, and they just ended up pushing it, you know, just forcing through it. The abdominal pressure that we were applying was probably um, not sufficient to actually stop the diaphragm from moving much. Uh, and the amount of pressure required might have been too much for the patient to be able to tolerate. So, it, again, it may have simply been that the therapists that were applying the abdominal compression didn't want to hurt the patient, and so they didn't put enough pressure on the patient to actually make the device useful. But years of data showed that, at least in clinical practice, this wasn't going to be going to be helpful. Uh, we actually we the the way we designed the study was kind of cool. Um, every patient on this study had a CT scan. There was a video called a 4D CT, and it actually monitored the lung lesion as a function of respiration. So we actually got a video of this lung lesion moving up and down. And we did a CT with abdominal compression and without abdominal compression on the set on every patient. So every patient had, so it was an apples to apples comparison. We weren't comparing one group of patients that had it to one group of patients that didn't. We were comparing the same patients against each other. So each patient had abdominal compression, had a 4D CT scan. And then a, an abdominal, and then a non-abdominal compression. So we were giving the patients a little bit more radiation, but it was, uh, but we basically had uh, proved to our institution that that was 
um, a minor uh, a minor risk to a cancer patient to have an extra CT scan uh, compared to the benefits to proving that this was working. And we were also interested in from a clinical point of view, not just from a research point of view. Um, so it wasn't just about publishing, it was actually about, you know, making useful results and affecting uh, patients' treatments in the future. And it did, we don't use abdominal compression anymore. We, we, we have the belts, um, they're tossed in a cupboard, and, um, and any time a physician comes into our department and tries to use it, we say, nope, here's a paper that probably doesn't work, so we don't, we don't want to use it. Um, so uh, one of the uh, most recent research projects I worked on uh, was um, designing a new method to treat uh, uh, breast cancer patients. Um, there are lots and lots of different types of treatment uh, designs for breast cancer patients. Uh, I came up with a new one um, that was able to focus uh, and conform the radiation um, to the tumor uh, more uh, accurately. Uh, so the radiation wasn't treating unnecessary breast tissue um, so, uh, it was basically just an idea that we had that might, this might work. Uh, we then started doing it and uh, we liked what we saw. We tested it on some patients that had already been treated. So, we just designed the treatments just to see if, if we had treated this, would it have been better? And then once we'd done that, we actually started treating actual patients with this. Um, and then um, we, we went back and we retrospectively looked at our results comparing uh, patients, uh, well, we weren't really comparing like one patient against another. Uh, it was kind of a hypothetical study. So we were looking at uh, patients that could have been treated one method versus what if we'd have treated them with the other method. We have the CTs of the patient, so we can just look at those CTs, do the two different treatments and compare and find out which one would give the least dose to the breast tissue, which one would give the least dose to the heart, things like that. Um, so we did a paper on that, published it, so that now you know lots of people can look this up and be like, okay, I I can now design this treatment. So I, I know that there are other places in the country now um, doing this uh, because we kind of uh, spread the word that this was a good good technique. We tried to call it the Toledo the Toledo technique, but I don't know if it actually stuck. <laughs> so uh, last thing we're going to do is we're just kind of kind of follow a patient um, through the treatment process. So what do we, what happens when a patient comes into the department? Uh, what do we do? What are we involved in um, from the patient to go from the, the point where they've been diagnosed with cancer, the physicians talk to them and said, okay, radiation, radiation therapy is gonna be useful for you. We're gonna treat this with radiation. From that point forward, what actually happens to the time that they're treated? So it is um, not a particularly simple process. Every patient gets customized treatment plans based on their specific uh, tumor shape, size, location, uh, their individual anatomy. We have a CT scan of every patient. Every patient's CT scan is going to be different. And then we design a unique treatment plan for every patient. So what, what does that involve? So first of all, um, we're not just treating one patient. We have a whole bunch of patients. Uh, cancer is relatively um, prevalent in a large population. Uh, most common cancers being breast cancer in women, prostate cancer in men. Um, you have still a fairly large population of lung cancer patients, although it's predicted that in the next 10, 20 years, uh, the generation of uh, the next generation of cancer patients will likely not be smokers, uh, or at least not as much as the previous generation that's currently going through uh, currently getting to the age where they would get cancer and radiation therapy. So the people that are in their 60s and 70s and 80s now are getting lung cancer because they back in the 60s and 70s and 80s they were smoking. Um, now it's not as prevalent, so we shouldn't see as much lung cancer in this country at least. Um, but there are, you know, there are plenty of cancers that are, are popular, uh, that are common. So this is an example. This doesn't actually include any real patient data. We've uh, removed the, the name just in case you're wondering if we were actually treating photo bangings. Nope. Uh, <laughs> um, we've, we've replaced the names of the patients with fake names so that we're not violating any uh, patient confidentiality. Um, but then we have the patients that we're working on the data which they got a CT scan, 
Um, the area that we're treating, we have two different treatment machines. One of them is uh, a well that is designed to treat very small lesions more accurately, but can't treat bigger things. Um, and then the other one is kind of more general purpose treatment machine. Um, we have a column that could, if we have multiple physicians, who's responsible for that patient? Uh, I told you how we have four physics faculty. Um, I'm purple. Um, Dr. Uh, Sperling is blue, Dr. Schwitker is green, and Dr. Parsai is orange. So we have each our assigned patients. Um, we might be working with a student or a resident who will actually be designing the treatments as part of their education. And then all of these steps are part of the part of the process of, uh, of, of getting the patient ready for treatment. So, for example, we might need to use multiple types of images, CT scans, MRIs, PET scans, that kind of thing. And so we're going to have to fuse all those images together and take uh, and take information from one and fuse it on top of another one. So we do uh, lots of like fusions. Um, the physician has to give us the target, the area that we're going to treat. They draw that. They write the prescription. We design the treatment. Uh, a physicist signs off on the treatment. A physician signs off on the treatment. And then the rest of this is kind of like paperwork and checking, making sure we have all the records in place, making sure that we've tested the treatment to make sure that every patient's treatment is safe. So we actually do test a lot of the treatments before the patient comes in um, for that first treatment. We will put a device down on the table and, and irradiate it and then analyze to make sure it is actually the, kind of the fluence that we were expecting. So the first step of that process is the patient has to come in and get a CT scan. So I'm actually wearing the same tie. It's like I only have one tie. So that's the CT scan. This is actually a PET CT. The first donut is a CT scanner. Second donut is a um, is a physiological scanner, a PET scanner that's able to track tumor uptake to sugar. Um, so you can actually identify where the lesion is using that. And you can you can if you can't that's if you can't see it on a CT scan. So the patient goes into the CT scanner. Every patient gets this. They're immobilized. They're in a somewhat uncomfortable position, but because our our CT scanner has a flat tabletop, not dissimilar to this, like it's hard. The reason for that is that if you put like a nice comfy couch on it, they would. One day they would be rolled, the next day they would be rolled a different way. So it has to be flat and uncomfortable. So they're lying down on that and they're kind of immobilized. Um, uh, this person's got her arms above her, her head and she's actually got like a support system that's molded to her body on each side. Um, and it and it's custom fit to fit that patient. Once we get the CT scan, we need the physician to actually tell us where the tumor is. So it is the physician's job to write the prescription and also to um, identify the tumor. So this is actually done using a mouse. They uh, they take the CT scan and then they draw with the mouse the actual tumor. And uh, once we have that and the physician writes the prescription, then we can design, we can start the process of designing the treatments, figuring out how best to get radiation beams um, onto that target uh, while minimizing the dose to the surrounding uh, structures. Um, this is a lung cancer patient. Uh, we're looking at the top of the heart. Uh, this is the bifurcation of the trachea. So we're about at this level here. The trachea comes down and then splits into the two major bronchi. These are the two major bronchi. So that's kind of the level we're at. This is the aorta. Um, this is the patient's left lung and right lung. And you can see the ribs. Uh, this is the scapula, the shoulder blade. So um, that's kind of, we have a CT scan of the patient. We get very used to identifying anatomy on CT scans. I don't have to do any cross-sectional anatomy and identify organs inside a patient, but I do actually have to be able to look at images, CT and MRI, PET scans, and be able to identify the anatomy there. Because we have to also identify, we have to actually tell our computer where it is. So um, in, this, um, in this picture, we've segmented the lungs, uh, the spinal cord, uh, the esophagus, uh, the liver, the stomach, the kidneys, um, the bowel, uh, the heart, and again, you can just about see the uh, esophagus that goes behind behind the heart there. So we have to do that, um, although um, modern like AI is now starting to get to the point uh, 
where it should be able to identify these things for us, but it doesn't work all of the time. That's kind of one of the things that Shannon's working on, project to identify um, how good the software is at identifying the organs, how, and how much time do we need to spend fixing it to make it correct, because it doesn't always get it right. It's, uh, trying to guess where the patient's bowel is based on previous education of where other patients' bowels have been, and it doesn't, it doesn't always get it right. From that point on, we can start designing the treatment. Um, so we start putting beams or arcs of radiation onto the tumor, and we'll try and get a dose distribution. So this is these colors here represent different levels of dose. Uh, we're trying to get uh, as much radiation to the tumor as possible uh, while minimizing dose to the surrounding tissue. So you can see here, we're doing our best to avoid the lungs, which are quite sensitive to radiation. Um, at the expense of giving a little bit more dose to the spinal canal. Uh, the spinal canal is kind of a more of a, um, a, it's a structure that doesn't really, um, doesn't really show any symptoms of damage until it's like too late and it's paralyzed. <laughs> so you want to make sure you don't go above the paralysis level, but any level of radiation below that doesn't really cause as serious a side effects as what we would have if we irradiated the lungs instead of the spinal canal. Um, we often use modulated beams of radiation. So this little picture here shows uh, a patient's neck um, with a tumor in the neck and the head. And there's the eyes and the parotid glands and spinal canal. Um, and then there's beams of radiation going around the patient. And these little colors represent the intensity of the radiation at a specific point in space. So we can actually modulate the intensity of the radiation in our beam. Um, and we can, we can do that by uh, sweeping collimators across the beam. So if we uh, have collimators that sweep across the beam, we can change the intensity of the radiation um, as a function of position within the radiation field. Uh, that allows us to basically um, deliver a dose of radiation to this weird-shaped tumor while sparing the parotids um, and the spinal canal and, and getting the radiation to shape where we want it to. Once we've designed the treatment and we've uh, done all the paperwork, we want to test that treatment out. So we have a number of different devices. This is one example. We've got a cylindrical version of this as well, but this one is a planar detector. Uh, it has about 1200 diodes, radiation detector diodes in it. And um, it can measure the fluence of the beam so that we can take the plan that we designed for the patient uh, compute that onto a planar surface and then compare that to what we measure. So we're able to do that and to test, um, uh, test the treatment plans uh, that we deliver. Uh, this was intended to be a video that shows the uh, gantry moving around the patient, but you just have to imagine it's moving around. And we're also able to take a CT scan of the patient and compare it to the one that we use to design the treatment. So the patient's lying on the table, our job is to make sure they're in exactly the right position before we turn the beam of radiation on. So to do that, we rotate the X-ray source around the patient, get a three-dimensional CT image scan, and then we actually compare that to the one that we use to design the treatment, and we can move we can move them around until we see that they overlap perfectly. And as we actually move the images around one on top of the other to make the anatomy match, the computer is actually monitoring how much do I need to move the patient to get these to align up perfectly. So this, this couch that the patient is lying on is robotically controlled. It can move up and down, in and out. It can tilt. It can roll. It can yaw. So we get the patient exactly aligned so that the patient's anatomy of the tumor lines up exactly where it's supposed to be, exactly under the beam of radiation. So we do that prior to turning on the beam. That's one of the things um, that we will have to, you know, one, when I go down to the machine and I'm looking at um, patient set up, making, I'm looking at these images and authorizing that the, 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 the they can start this treatment. Um, this was also supposed to be a video, but this is just the gantry rotating around the patient and an example of what a small tumor in the lung might look like. Um, we can, we design the beams of radiation to conform uh, to these little lesions like that. Uh, so we've kind of maybe seen a couple of pictures of what the machine itself looks like, uh, but obviously there's quite a complicated control um, system that's outside of the treatment room. Um, we have therapists who, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, put the patient down in the, in the treatment room, um, uh, align them, 
uh, they have to verify that they're treating the right patient by, even if they know the patient, they have to ask them their name and date of birth to verify it's the correct patient. Um, then they have to pull up the patient's treatment plan on this console here. So they know that they're treating Fordow Baggins. So Fordow Baggins is on the treatment table. They bring up Fordow Baggins' plan. Everything that the machine has done has been programmed ahead of time so that when they deliver the treatment, the gantry rotations, those collimator positions, the energy of the radiation, the output units of radiation, all of that stuff has been stored in this console. All the therapists have to do, and I'm oversimplifying their job, but they have to make sure the patient's in the correct position, load up the correct patient, and then hit the go button. And then the go button then delivers the actual treatment plan that we have designed. So they don't have to type any, they don't, in the old days, they used to actually have to type everything in. Now, obviously, it's not necessary, it's all stored. And um, the, all, everything is stored in our, in our medical record. Once that's done, then the patient is treated. We review all those records. So if you're interested and you want to know more about this, um, we have a website that I recommend you check out. It's got some uh, uh, testimonials from students that have uh, been through our program. Uh, we actually have a YouTube channel, so we make um, we make some videos uh, of stuff that we're doing in the clinic. Um, uh, we do educational seminars like this, and we record them, and we put those on YouTube, so you can find out about that. So that's on our YouTube channel. And then we also have a Twitter account, so we just kind of like, just for, you know, sh showing pictures of what's going on in the department, what our students are up to and stuff like that. So most recently, we just graduated a new class of students and a new class of residents. We graduated... Uh, this group of uh, this group of students here, um, all of them got into a residency program. So we had 100% success rate getting students into residency this year, which is really good. And then we also graduated two residents this year. Um, both of them had multiple job offers before they actually left the program. So there's actually a need for uh, medical physicists now. Um, there's not enough education programs to satisfy the need um, of the radiation oncology community. It's not a massive difference, but it does mean that uh, when people graduate, they have options. They have to pick one job and you know that's the only job they get. So they move to Butthole, Indiana. They actually have choices, you know, places you can go. So uh, we have one guy who grew up in New York City and he really wanted to go back to his family in New York. So he, he got a job that was like within an hour of New York City. Um, another guy that grew up kind of in the South uh, and he wanted to go back there. So he took a job in Florida, starts in Naples. He's actually, his last day was Friday. So he, went, he headed down to Naples this weekend and he's starting his new job July the 1st. All right, so if anyone's got any questions, I'll be sticking around for a little while. Um, or you can Google my name and email me. Or you can contact Shannon. And she's going to be talking next week. You got to see that. I don't know. <laughs> Busted. Oh, yeah. So uh, did you have any questions for Dave? Yep. Do you want to, like, shadow it a little? 